Hello, everyone. I think we can start soon. I can see that my microphone is working. My camera is working as well. The screen sharing is working, uh, but I can see that we already have some issues uh, with the presentation here. Um, so let me just uh, quickly fix that. Can't really see well because of the light, but hopefully it's this button. Okay, much better. So welcome to my talk. It's called how to improve security of your Meteor app. My name is Felix Pensonek, and I prepared this talk with help of my colleague, Patrick Kowalik. So first something about us. We are currently working as penetration testers at Vasco. And at our job, we do black box penetration tests and black box means that we don't have an access to the application source code. And we pretend that we are hackers and try to find all security vulnerabilities in the application. And then we write really long reports on the results of these tests. So now about the talk, the talk is divided into five parts and these are client side authorization, server side authorization, denial of service attacks, vulnerable packages, and security headers. And just a quick, quick note at the beginning, I just want to say that uh, these examples uh, are not uh, made up for the purpose of the presentation. They're actually taken from our previous uh, tests. Okay, so first client side authorization. Another note here, recently OWASP updated their uh, top uh, web application security vulnerability list. After four years, there is new version. And now at the top, there is broken access control. And in the part uh, one and two, examples I will show you belong to this category. And this is quote from uh, OWASP top 10 page. And it says that access control is only effective when the attacker cannot modify this uh, controls check. So let's see how it works in practice. I'll show you the example. So in the first example, the user says, I want to open settings. And the application script says, okay, so let me check your user ID by calling this method meteor user ID. So the application script checks his user ID and renders user settings. When, uh, where he has three buttons, he can change his email, password, and avatar. But another user, and this one is wearing a black hood, also wants to open settings. But first, he's gonna try something. So he changes his Meteor user ID to administrator's ID using this uh, function, Meteor connection set user ID. And just like before, application script checks his user ID, but this time it renders administrator settings where he's got two additional buttons, impersonate user and manage permissions. And on this example, we can see that client side authorization is easy to bypass and it's not going to stop users from using methods that don't have server side authorization. These are other examples how this attacker could bypass this uh, authorization. So he could, for an example, redeclare some functions, is super user of all or user is in role to always return true. So some thoughts about this example, hiding methods won't stop users from calling them and don't rely on client side authorization because it can always be bypassed one way or another. Next part, server side authorization. So when you look at this example, you see there is a method called download file and it takes few parameters. 
file name is a path to the file stored in the cloud storage and document ID is ID of uh, this document. So in this case, the user is the owner of a file with this blue document ID. He wants to download that file because he's the owner, the access is granted to him. But what if he tries downloading file of somebody else? Okay, so because there is this authorization, he can do this. He's not the owner of uh, this file. Uh, he can't download that file. So the verification is working. Or is it? Actually, he tries changing document ID to the ID of the document that he's the owner of, but leaves file name unchanged. So the file name is uh, starting with document ID of other user. And with this trick, he managed to bypass the authorization and he can download file uh, belonging to any user on this website. So let's go to the next example. There is this place in the application when you're asked to upload scan of your ID and it accepts only images. So there is this Meteor method and it uses slingshot package which is uh, used to, to allow users uploading files uh, directly to the cloud storage from their browser without passing these files uh, through the application servers. So first it just sends request to the application servers to generate upload policy and the signature. And then when everything is all right, the user can upload file di directly to the cloud storage. So in this case, user wants to upload myimage.png with file type image slash png and as expected upload is successful but this user is a hacker and he wants to hack the administration of this website so he tries uploading malicious bash script but because there is a verification uh, the message is wrong file type and he can't upload that file. And now with the knowledge from previous uh, example, I will give you a few seconds and I want you to try to guess what the attacker changed here to upload this script uh, to the cloud storage and to bypass that verification. Maybe somebody have an idea, you can guess. Yeah, so I already can see correct answer. So because uh, the message is wrong file type, he tries changing the type. And actually this is a way to bypass that uh, verification. So he leaves name as malicious.sh, changes type to image PNG, and with this very simple trick, he managed to bypass uh, this verification. So what can we actually learn from these examples? It's very important to always uh, test all the parameters in the methods because uh, it may look like your uh, authorization that you implemented in methods is working when uh, you're casually using your application, but when you test every parameter separately, uh, it may actually uh, turn out that uh, it's like in these examples. So when you check a single, when you change single parameter, it may actually check only for type and ignore name. So it's important to verify all the parameters, especially if they are somehow connected to each other. Like in this case, type is directly connected to the extension present in the file name. Next part is denial of service attacks. On the screen, you can see an example uh, rundown on how such an attack uh, could look like in the Meteor environment. So first, you have to connect to random WebSocket, then send a handshake message. To speed up this whole process, you can use Python 3 with uh, multi-processing library. And if you launch this attack, the application should slow down 
hang on, or in some cases even crash. Here's this example script. So it does exactly what I just said. Here you can uh, choose the host. Here it connects to WebSocket, sends the handshake message. And this last part is responsible for doing that many times per second. Because in the category of multi-request denial of service attacks, the number of requests is crucial. Okay, so how can you protect your application from these attacks? You can use Meteor Galaxy App Protection because it has this functionality to limit incoming requests. You can set a limit and any additional requests will not reach your application. If you are interested, you can uh, read more about this uh, functionality under this link, galaxyguidemeteor.com slash protection. And I think it uh, can be useful for you to protect uh, from this kind of uh, denial of service attacks. But another category of these attacks is those attack with a single request. So this one is a little bit more tricky because we are using a method update user. And it takes some parameters, first name, last name, and phone numbers. And please notice that here phone numbers are stored in the array. So user can have multiple phone numbers. So the attacker who wants to do some harm to the application tries sending 100,000 phone numbers. So he creates this array very long and fills it with twos. And in this case, application has a problem with handling an array this big, gets totally overloaded and is just inaccessible for normal users. So how can we fight this kind of DOS attack? Can you limit incoming requests? Not really, it's a single WebSocket message. Can you use DDP rate limiter to limit WebSocket messages? You can limit, but it's still, it's just a single message, so it won't do any good. So what I recommend is to think about all the operations that user can perform that are CPU heavy and try to control them. Try to limit maximum values so that whatever values user passes, uh, it won't break your application. Like in this case, uh, the user never needs uh, 100,000 phone numbers. I think 100 is more than enough and it won't break your application. So go through all your methods and think what could uh, use most CPU power and try to set maximum values and control these methods. Next part is vulnerable packages. So let me read a short introduction to this example. The application uses React File Viewer package so the administrators can conveniently display files uploaded by users in the application. Unfortunately, this package is no longer maintained and depends on an old version of pdfjs-dist, which has a known security bug. And this bug allows an attacker to place an XSS payload in the calculator function inside this PDF file. So here you can see contents of this PDF file. Here's this calculator function. And in the domain parameter, attacker inserted some JavaScript code. In this case, when the administrator will try to display that file, this line will execute and send his session token to the attacker's server. So without even knowing, the administrator will give an access to his account by just displaying uh, that file. So even though the application itself was secure and immune to cross-site scripting attacks, the vulnerable package created a possibility for an attacker to compromise an administrator's account. And what can we do about it? Always make sure that packages you're using are up to date and have no known security flaws. So there is this cool 
online tool, Sneak IO Advisor. You can go to that address in your browser and search for NPM packages. And you can view whether they have some security issues. They also have a command line tool uh, and you can use it to scan all of your packages uh, you have in your project, similar to the way NPM audit does it. And you can also use NPM audit because it works a similar way. Okay. And the last part is about security headers. And security headers uh, are a great way to increase the overall security of your application without much effort. So my recommendation is to use Helmet.js. It's also a recommendation of official Meteor guide because it's well compatible with Meteor. And for Meteor developers, it should be easy to implement it with Helmet.js. So here's a link. If you don't have security headers implemented already, give it a read and it should be useful to you. Maybe you don't know what are these security headers or maybe you are not sure whether you have this already implemented in your website. So you can use uh, this cool online tool, securityheaders.com. Here you can enter address for any website and uh, see whether uh, security headers are set. It will also give you a grade, like in school, for an example, if uh, you have all the security headers properly set, you will receive an A. And if you have none, you should probably uh, receive F. So don't worry, I'm not going to read all of this. I just want to give you an idea what security headers can be used for. So content security policy will protect you from cross-site scripting attacks. X-frame options will protect you from clickjacking attacks by not letting other websites put yours inside of an iframe. X content type options prevents content type sniffing and strict transport security ensures that your application is always accessed through HTTPS connection and not HTTP. So other people on your network can see your password in plain text when you log in, for an example. Okay, and that, that's it from me. These were five parts. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Oh, okay, I skipped the slide. If you have any questions, please ask them on chat and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. Okay, so I will wait for a while because I know there is a question here. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I can see the question. Do you find Meteor apps to be more or less secure than uh, other nodes apps? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I can't really tell definitely whether they are more or less secure. They're just Meteor has its own uh, unique things. So maybe if you work more on the Meteor applications, you can see more uh, security vulnerabilities here. But I wouldn't say it's uh, exceptionally more or less secure than other nodes apps. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you for the link.
screen. I see the chat is more alive here than on Zoom. Okay, so uh, I can see some question about uh, regex injection and uh, data, data, database query. And actually, uh, I know this was a thing in the past that uh, many things in Meteor could be hacked uh, because of passing uh, MongoDB filters, for an example. But from our recent tests, from applications that uh, we've been testing, we actually noticed that, that uh, in these applications, at least, it wasn't a problem because uh, none methods uh, that are available for the normal users, not administrator or pro or whatever, uh, had no possibility to, to use uh, database filters. So these were uh, always, uh, they accepted only strings or uh, integers, but never uh, these filters. And I think also it's a good approach. If you have a method used only by administrators, yeah, why not? You can use these filters, they shouldn't break anything, but a normal user shouldn't have access to this. Uh, regarding the single request in our service attack, do you have to protect against array, array numbers only? Or, there's, or there are other examples? Um, okay, so, here I gave you example with the array, but uh, what I what I wanted to say uh, with uh, checking CPU heavy methods is that often you have some methods uh, in your application that uh, calculate something. So you have method that calculates some numbers, and then uh, attacker can think of a certain combination of numbers, or uh, launch this method in. Uh, in such a scenario that these calculations would be very difficult for the application. So it's not only arrays or maximum uh, numbers, but also in general methods that uh, have to calculate something or that have to use uh, some CPU uh, time. Okay, and Michael asked in your view, what is the main difference between Galaxy App Protection and DDP rate limiter? Okay, so mm, the difference here is that uh, in Galaxy App Protection, it limits the number of HTTP requests incoming to your server uh, before it actually reaches your application server. But uh, DDP rate limiter limits the uh, number of WebSocket messages on a single connection. So that's a subtle difference. Uh, so DDP rate limiter limits uh, invoking uh, methods and subscriptions uh, in your actually uh, uh, in your present Meteor WebSocket connection, but app protection just uh, blocks additional requests that are above the limit. But I think still it's best to use both. Yeah, and Machi also, also said that it doesn't have to be an array because a string can also uh, do harm if it's not handled correctly. Yeah, I believe if a string, for an example, string is, for an example, then separated into some substrings. If it's too long, it also could overload the application. We still have some time. So if anybody wants to ask something, then please. Do I plan to write an article? Uh, maybe, 
I haven't really thought about that. Uh, but now that you bring that up, maybe I should consider writing an article about this. I will consider it. And what is a good limit per second? Uh, this actually really depends on your use case in the application. Because uh, for some applications, uh, 10 uh, requests per second can be enough, but others can use hundreds. So it's, uh, it's really difficult to tell without knowing your application. It's best to just set a limit and if it breaks something in your application, then try to raise it. Because the number of requests to DOS your application really has to be quite uh, significant. Do we need to block these headers? Uh, no, I mean, you should probably use these headers, these response headers in your uh, application. And if you want to read more about uh, security headers and what they do and how to properly uh, set them, I recommend you go to OWASP Secure Headers Project. And they have some interesting info. And the Helmet JS, there are also uh, some examples. And uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, I recommend you to look how other websites have their, uh, these headers configured. And you can look that up on securityheaders.com. Just enter the address of the website and, and check it. And here I will link you secure headers project. What is your contact info? Okay, I will just write it in chat. Uh, it's Felix Pensonek at vasco.eu. Okay, I think uh, maybe there are still some more questions. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then thank you for coming to this talk and listening. I hope you learned something useful and that's it from me. Don't get hacked. And if you're wondering uh, whether your application is secure, you can always contact us uh, at vasco.eu and we'll try to help you. So thank you and uh, goodbye. <laughs>